about a quick buck stops here before Nathan gets in and then Simon Goodwin joins us. If they can find those blokes that are brawling and kicking got that kid down in the jumpers that they're in, and they should be banned for 10 years, if not life. Over to you. I agree because the feeling, the general feeling was really positive. Great. And you don't need to... Um, you don't need to go there. You if it's be... soccer, if it's another sport, we jump up and down. We go, how bad is this? Well, this is a horrible, horrible look on and what is uh, normally something that we pride ourselves and on. And I would hate that we need to adjust and affect the experience of 99% of the population just for the one. Yep. All right. Number one, and we've been talking about it all morning, footy at the G. Um, I just loved it. Sunday afternoon, 3.20, yeah, a little bit in the day, a little bit at night. It was just a great feel. 80,000 people, two big Victorian clubs. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Um, the specifics of the game, we'll get into that a little later, or do you want to get into it here? No, I just, it's just, 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 about, about just about the event. And obviously, you know, you, you were talking about missing your reverse, um, your reverse camera. Yeah. Like, w- we've come out of a situation where we haven't been able to go to the footy, and we've forgotten about that real quick. Mm-hmm. But, geez, you get reminded about the best parts of it. And yep. um, I thought that was uh, awesome for the game, awesome for the code. Uh, I loved it. Um, second, Fremantle winning on the MCG. Um, there's certain games and certain times that come around in a season or in, a, in an evolution of a team that give you a chance to reinforce your improvement. Mm-hmm or to take the next step and present yourself as bona fides. And winning on the MCG for Fremantle on the weekend was one of those. Losses in really um, inclement conditions over the last couple of weeks. Um, no Fife, and they think Fife's going to be the saviour. Uh, everyone keeps talking about that, but he hasn't been in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, with the group that have set their season alight, they were able to um, to get over a side that hadn't hadn't been beaten. <clears throat> pardon me, hadn't been beaten yet uh, for the year, and that's where. I'll, and I'll get to the to Melbourne uh, in a moment. Number three for me is um, Gold Coast in the Northern Territory. Every team looking for a competitive advantage somewhere. They've played this. They played the first of two games up in the top end, can the Gold Coast make this a competitive advantage in the middle of the year when they've got sides coming up from winter into a more humid, um, you know, warmer environment. environment and, you know, put two or three wins away in the middle of the season. And, um, you know, that win against Hawthorne was full of merit. Uh, play North Melbourne up there next week. So that's that back-to-back. So they'll, they'll spend the week uh, up in Darwin. Um, but yeah, they've they've uh, every chance that they could sort of position themselves at the bottom edges of the eight once we get the, through the buy rounds. Um, the fourth one I've got is is there's tipping points. Every club has a tipping point in regards to you know availability of players and injury, and um, you know whether it's Carlton's injury list losing Wittering during the game after having McKay, Pitney, Williams not available. Whether it's Melbourne who haven't got Langdon, May gets injured, Petrarca's a little bit crook. Everyone can be vulnerable if you don't have your best players available. You, you have to fall back onto system. You were mentioning that you don't reckon the Carlton fans are sort of kick, sort of jumping up and down as much this morning, and I reckon there's a really good reason for it because they saw a side that was that had a lot of players out of their best, you know, maybe four or five of their best twenty-two that didn't play the game, and their bookends, you know, their best key defender, their best key forward but yet played with system, played with passion and still gave themselves a chance to come back, back and win the game. And that's, that's great to see. But there is a tipping point. There's only so long you can do that because to win games and for a system to stack up, you still need to do the basics well. And there's still contests to be won. But they did enough of that, Carlton. And it actually augurs really well for what we're going to see in the uh, second part of the year. Last one is um, the next three weeks. Uh, we've got a really even comp. We're going into the buy rounds. When we get to round 14, I've got every, uh, I'd, I'd suspect that there will still be a lot of sides that are outside the eight that are still a chance to be inside the eight. So Gold Coast could get there. You know, Port Adelaide is still thereabouts. Uh, Richmond are now outside of the eight. Gaz, I just reckon the competition is uh, in good shape. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of teams with bona fides all the way down to 12th. I reckon between 6th and 12th. We won't know, or even fifth and twelfth, we won't know who the final eight sides are going to be until well into the season. The longer it goes, the better. So the top five there, footy at the G yesterday. Um, Fremantle winning on the MCG. How important is that? They don't get to play there too often. The Gold Coast of the Northern Territory. They only play 
three, I think, of the top eight teams in the run home. And they've got North Melbourne and West Coast twice. The Gold Coast Suns, tipping points and injuries. And the next three weeks in the even competition. So lots of talking points there. I had a couple I'd like to add just specifically. Yep. That boy Oliver Henry, whose form in the past few weeks has just been on an upward curve. When I watched his under-18 tape, you thought, this is what you hoped he would be. Now, I know in your first year, he was too, it was too raw too early, and you can tell me whether you played him too early or not. But he's doing now, over the past three or four weeks, the things that he was doing in his last year of under-18 footy. So when you see that, and you see it's transferable to the absolute elite, then you've got a player on your hands. And what he's been able to do, he's actually been, so he played, I reckon he, he, we played him probably seven games out of the first 11 last year. Yep. And I reckon if we're really, if we're really serious, he probably only earned two or three of those. Yep. And he got dropped two or three times. You do that though, because he's got to get games well, in we, him. And we, we could see the talent yep. and, and what he could do on the track. And he's been dropped this year as well. So yeah. I mean, he's, so that actually shows resilience of the kid mm. as well to say, okay, you've come up, yep. not the level, come up, not the level, come up, not the level. And then he's put two games together. He kicked seven goals in two games, one as a sub. And he looks like he, – he, he, and he played very well last he's week. He actually um, put three yesterday. games together. The other one, he just happened to miss everything he kicked. So he, he had six shots in the first quarter and a half the other about three weeks ago, and he ended up getting dropped on the back of that. And he's only halfway through his second season. Ooh, and he's, he's jumping – when you watch him jump at the footy, he's honest in the air. Now, that, yep. that, that means some players sort of don't like it and you know, get a bit uncomfortable. He just is genuinely honest in the air. Uh, Friday night, um, you know what I'm thinking about Sam De Koning. I'm glad that the rest of the world is waking Starting up to this the kid. On. Um, so he will probably play on Aaron Norton on Friday night. Now, the, we, I've talked about Rising Star stuff, and it's only a market at the moment. So the market has got Nick Dacos is having to go. He's, Nick Dacos is at $2 and whatever he is, 21 He's not 10 times. Nick Dacos is not 10 times more certain to win the NAB Rising Star than Sam DeConning. Let me give you the tip right now. If he plays on Aaron Norton, Aaron Norton might slice him. Mm. I don't know with his athleticism and everything else, but if, if he does really well on Aaron Norton, then he is in the best two or three Rising Star. Well, he's, he, he, he is at an advantage because he's a part of one of the best defensive units in the comp. And they, they just set the ground up really well. So it allows yeah. his strengths to come to the fore. But floor. he still has to defend one-on-one -on -one against the best opposition key forward in his 10th game at, of footy. At times. At times. No, every week, according to Chris Scott. He's playing on the best of four. Yeah, I know. But you, but very rarely, if he's getting caught, one, if you're even your best defender, if they're getting caught one-on-one -on -one too often, well, then you're not playing the game yeah, the way that, that you want Yeah, to play. that's okay. But yeah, you're still going to win your contest. Yep. And... And he wins a fair share of them, doesn't he? Yes, he does. So that I'm looking forward to Friday night. Coaching for me on the weekend. So I'm looking at it and we go, okay, coaches, do they influence results? You know, once the game starts, what can they do? Well, they can do plenty. Friday night, John Longmire pulled the Callum Mills behind the ball card, right? So they're stuck. They can't move the footy. Nothing's happening. One coach, it, didn't, didn't, it wasn't the only determinant of the result. But that coach in this instance or that coaching team said, mm. let's put Mills behind the footy as a seventh and the whole game changed. So big tick, coaching changes things. Fremantle, half time, six goals to two. Can't move the footy against Melbourne. Stuck. Oliver's on a tear. Come out, change. Aish goes and takes responsibility for Oliver. Um, just at a different way they wanted to play the, you know, play yep. the game. Yep. Centre bounce at the start of, that, of the third quarter was... Aish, it was Walters, it was a complete different look, 9-1 out of the middle, 8-goal mm. third quarter, mm. coaches change things. I like the fact that they're prepared to swing moves and make changes. How how the, the Mills won as the seventh, yep. when do you reckon that would have been instigated? Like From memory, it was half-time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was half-time in the game, but like how early do you reckon, at what stage do you think the coaching group discussed that Well, as a lever? I would imagine through the second quarter when they can't transition the footy. But they, I wouldn't be surprised if they thought they were going to get away with the fact that he could just play there on his own. Yeah, and it did surprise me. Richmond didn't square that up as much. It's it, That would have been built over the last month because mm. their back half ball use has actually been – the strength of the back half ball use of Sydney has been – noted yep. and then the weakness of it had been exploited in the in the months leading up so mm -hmm. that would have been um that would have been discussed and actioned as a as a go-to yeah for the last couple of weeks I loved it. and they pulled the trigger on it because they were because they needed to do something to win the game and it actually gave them 
their strength back. Yeah. There's still the capacity to defend, but then the extra number to shift and move the ball, I can't see an opposition allowing that no. luxury again. But be prepared to make the change. Don't let things roll along and, and do something about it, which I love. The other thing, I'm asking this question legitimately and with a healthy deal of scepticism. How bad was Mason Cox's finger injury when he was subbed out <laughs> in the pouring, pouring, hosing down rain last week against Fremantle and allowed Oliver Henry, Henry to come on and kick four, four goals, right? So, so bad was it that they said he's off. Get him off and he can't come back on and play for the rest mm. of that game. That's how bad that finger is. We, we have to sub. We, we, we're not going to strap it up and play him. It is that bad yep. that he must be in doubt for the following week. Yep. That was the assessment. Yep. Henry comes on and kicks four goals. Mason Cox, lo and behold, oh, no, he looks like he might play. Not yeah. only did he play, he clunked the ball as well as he's clunked it for four years. What is this sub rule all about? Well, we know that that is the latest example of what is becoming. Why do we let it go then? Well, why do we? How do, how do we let it go? How do we? Well, we just shrug our shoulders and go, oh, well, there's a they're rorting well, of the system. This Fair is, enough. The doctors are given a whole lot of respect and integrity and left with the, the defining decisions, we are told. I knew that as a senior coach. The doctor made the final call on all medical situations. Um, and the AFL are relying on that. I don't want to call any doctor into dispute because I've had dealings with a lot of them and they're all great. Yep. But there is a genuine, legitimate question to be asked about how bad that injury was that meant that you had to get him off the ground at all costs and not let him play the game I'm out against you, Freo. Because there's, there, if, if you have an injury to a player and the doctor says you can either you, you can either continue with him or not mm. once they get once you get into that gray area then it's actually not a it's not a doctor's decision it becomes a coach's decision on whether you say no we want him to keep going can you do that mm. yes or no or no no that's okay we'll take your call and we'll let it we'll we'll, we'll make the change but i reckon you just got to re- remove the medical part to well, that sub and, the, and then and then it 